So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we have uh, in the colloquium uh, Jorge Zavala, uh, who is currently a, a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he uh, completed his PhD at Inaoe, uh, and he uh, well he works with high redshift galaxies uh, with the, with the, um, uh, with radio and submillimeter, and today he's going to talk uh, to us about the infrared luminosity function and thus obscured star formation in the last 13 billion years. So welcome, Jorge, and uh, well, I give you with Jorge Zavala. Cool, well, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the invitation and for having me here. And thank you all for joining, joining me, at least virtually. And yes, as Rene said, I'm going to talk about a recent result that we have done, basically trying to constrain the infrared luminosity function and the dust obscure star formation rate density. Uh, in general, in the last 13 billion years, but particularly above redshift four, between redshift four and, and redshift seven, which is where our understanding of the infrared luminosity function and in general of dusty galaxies is actually very, limited because of current limitations and other things that I'm going to, to present here. And this is work that I am doing as part of, of the COSMOS collaboration, and particularly with, new, with a new survey that we have done with ALMA, which is a large mosaic at two millimeter um, that I'm going to present here as well. Um, okay. Yeah, well, first, just very brief introduction of why it's important to observe infrared and, and just long wavelength uh, surveys. So basically, here what we have what we have here in this plot is just a representation of the different background, uh, the extragalactic backgrounds. And if we remove the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. Basically, we have two peaks which dominate the, the energy of the universe. One is the cosmic infrared background, um, which is the first peak that we have here. And the other one, which basically have a rough similar energy is the cosmic optical background. So this means that if we want to, to have a complete picture of, sorry, I'm just, I have, okay, never mind. Yeah, so this means that if we want to have a complete picture of the um, star formation rate density of the universe and actually of every quantity related to the galaxy formation and evolution, we basically need to observe um, in both wavelengths, like optical wavelength and infrared wavelength in order to have like a complete picture of, of all these uh, phenomena. Um, and actually, this, this was very clear at the beginning when the first uh, submillimeter observation uh, were available. So in this figure where, where I'm showing, here we have like the same region of the sky, which is basically the Hubble deep field. And on the left, we have the observation from Hubble, which is, well, this what was called the Hubble deep field. And on the right, what I'm showing is uh, the same region of the sky and basically at the same dimensions but observe at submillimeter wavelength with, with the JCMT telescope. So on the image, uh, in the image of the, on the left, we can see basically that we have like hundreds of galaxies, like every point, like all, well, basically every point here is a galaxy. And we have around of hundred or possible thousand galaxies here. On the other hand, uh, on this, in the submillimeter map, we have actually only five detections. And, and the properties of these galaxies are very different. Like in the image of, on the left, like what we can see at visible or, or optical wavelength, we have uh, most of them like faint galaxies, which are not very massive. And in terms of star formation rate, the star forming galaxy that we have here, they, they have a star formation rates of around just a few solar masses per year. On the other hand, in the submillimeter map, we have only five galaxies. But these galaxies are very massive galaxies and actually very extreme galaxies, which start formation rates of um, hundreds of thousands of solar masses per year. 
And actually, uh, after follow-up observation, it was clear that the galaxies that, that were detected in submillimeter wavelength were actually invisible at optical wavelength. So this highlights the importance of obtaining uh, observation at different wavelengths in order to have a complete picture of the formation and evolution of galaxies. And these five galaxies actually uh, were found to, to be high redshift galaxies or relatively high redshift galaxies between redshift two and four. Uh, at the beginning, were, uh, these were only uh, photometric redshifts. Um, and in the image of the on the left, the galaxies that we have here, like they have a very different range of redshifts from very nearby galaxies to probably galaxies up to redshift uh, eight or nine or something like that. But what was clear from the beginning is that these galaxies, like the submillimeter selected galaxies, actually contribute a lot to, to the star formation rate density of the universe. And actually, if one just zoom these five galaxies uh, and make the correction for the volume density and, and all these things, we can derive uh, the star formation rate density, the dust obscure star formation rate density contribute by this uh, submillimeter selected galaxies. And this is the point that is um, illustrated here with, with the name Scuba Hubble Deep Field. And since this very first observation, it was clear that the star formation rate density or the picture that we have before from of the star formation rate density was actually different because before this observation, the current measurements um, are illustrated here by the gray region. So before this observation, basically, uh, we believe that the star formation rate density had, have a peak around redshift one or so. But then since the discovery of these galaxies, it was just clear that the star formation rate density actually peaks um, at higher redshift. And if you take into account these submillimeter selected galaxies, uh, the picture that we have is just very different that if we only uh, assume what we can understand from the UV or optical survey. So it has been uh, 20 years or a little bit more than 20 years in the first submillimeter observations. And during these last two decades, there have been like new facilities, uh, like telescope in Chile, Hawaii. Uh, we have also a space telescope like Herschel. And we have also the large millimeter telescope in Mexico. Um, and actually all these telescopes have, have done a, a significant progress on the field of submillimeter and millimeter astronomy. And this plot basically tries to summarize the different surveys as a function of area and and luminosity detection limit. Um, so basically now we have, yeah, the message that I want just to transmit here is that now we have uh, observation at submillimeter and millimeter observation of around uh, of a thousand square degrees. And we have detected around hundreds of thousands of submillimeter or millimeter selected galaxies. But one thing that is important to highlight is that, for example, if we look at the red square, this, these are the SPT surveys by the South Pole Telescope. These are the largest surveys uh, achieved so far, but that we can see the luminosity detection limit. Uh, I mean, this, these surveys can only detect very extreme galaxies with an infrared luminosity above 10 to the 13. Uh, yeah, so basically we are very limited to detect uh, the most abundant and, and, and more typical galaxies, which have uh, luminosities of around 10 to the 12. And the same is similar for Herschel. Like here, this plot actually uh, shows the sensitivity at redshift of two. But if we uh, make the estimation for a redshift of five, for example, the Herschel surveys, which are also the largest surveys at submillimeter wavelength, are also able to detect only very bright galaxies with luminosities above 10 to the 13, or also amplify galaxies, of course. The rest of the surveys that we have here in green and yellow, these are deep surveys, relatively deep surveys that can detect galaxies with luminosities of 10 to the 12 or, or a little bit below that, but they are limited to just a few square degrees in the sky. And more recently we have ALMA and of course with ALMA, we can detect very faint galaxies with luminosities below 10 to the 11 solar luminosities. But the area that we have is, 
just limited to a few uh, square arc minutes. So if we take all this information from all these surveys together, what we have, and well, an estimate the star formation rate density, what we have is, is something uh, which is very similar than, than this. This was a compilation that, that we presented like two years ago. And in red, we have the star formation rate density derived from infrared and submillimeter surveys, which is basically the dust obscure star formation rate density. And we now, we have like relatively good constraint up to redshift two or three. And we know that the peak is actually at, at around redshift of two, but beyond redshift of three, uh, basically the measurements that we have are very uncertain. And during the last year, there have been new measurements, particularly between redshift four and five, but the uncertainties in these measurements are around on, on the level of one dex. And there are differences in the estimations which go differ from uh, two order of magnitudes or so. Now, if we look at the blue points in the same figure, the, the picture from the UV optical surveys is actually very different. Uh, the star formation rate density from these surveys, which represent the unobscured star formation rate density, I mean, this has not been corrected by dust. Uh, they have like very good estimation up to at least up to redshift of eight, and there are measurements up to redshift of or ten of or eleven. So if we really want to understand the total star formation rate density, we need a better understanding or better constraints on the dust obscure star formation rate density, and particularly above redshift of four. And basically, there are two two possible scenarios like. Both scenarios have, have been proposed in the literature, actually. One is that above redshift of four, uh, the dust obscure star formation, uh, it's basically not significant or not dominant. It basically, yeah, it's not significant. And the other scenario which people have suggested is that the dust obscure star formation rate density actually dominates up to redshift of six. Uh, so basically the question is like, we, we, we have no good measurements of the dust obscure star formation rate density. And therefore we are not sure if the current estimation that we have from the UV optical surveys are complete or if they are incomplete. So it is, it is possible that we are missing a, a large population of dusty star forming galaxies. And therefore our understanding of the galaxy formation and evolution uh, could be totally different than what we think is now. The most recent result, or at least from the UV optical community, suggests that above redshift of six, the dust obscure star formation rate density is not important. Nevertheless, we have uh, examples that probably contradict this, or at least confirm the existence of very massive and very extreme star, dusty star forming galaxies uh, between redshift six or seven. And these are the only three galaxies, like classic submillimeter selected galaxies that have been identified above redshift of three, sorry, above a redshift of, of six. Um, oops, okay. These two galaxies, well, in general, the three galaxies are galaxies which have a star formation rate of around uh, 100 solar masses per year, or even some of them, these two, they have a star formation rate of, ta of a thousand solar masses per year. And the stellar mass that have been estimated for these galaxies is, is very large, like above 10 to the 10, to the 10 uh, solar mass, so 10 to the 10 solar masses, or probably even above 10 to the 11. So these galaxies are very extreme and have been found in a very early epoch of the universe. And of course, if you ask me what's, what's my favorite galaxy from this tree, but this is going to be this galaxy that we we detected using the large millimeter telescope. And this is the spectrum that, that we obtained with the LMT in which we detect two different transition of the CO lines and, and one uh, transition from, from water. Um, and this was actually um, highlighted in the cover of, of Nature Astronomy in, in that issue. The problem is that, as I said, this, well, the largest area surveys that we have are only able to detect the most extreme galaxies or amplified galaxies like this. So it happens that these three galaxies are actually amplified, gravitationally amplified. 
So if we want to estimate uh, the star formation rate density from these galaxies, we will just came with very highly uncertain measurements because in one scenario, for example, we can derive a lower limit if we assume that these galaxies are the only three galaxies in, in, in the area surveyed by, by this uh, observation. But it could, there is also a possibility in which there are more galaxies, but they are just below of our detection limit. So in this case, we, if we make some assumption, we can estimate something, a value which is around here. So basically we have a, no good constraint of the, of the space density of these galaxies. And the current data, which is, this is something more remarkable. The current data cannot distinguish between these two uh, very different scenarios. In one scenario, we have that dust obscure star formation rate density is uh, basically negligible above a relative of four. And the other scenario is that the dust obscure star formation rate density is basically flat from redshift two to six and therefore dominates the, the star formation rate density uh, during the last 13 billion years of the universe. Uh, so again, the current data cannot distinguish between these two scenarios, at least until a year ago or so. Uh, oh, and yes, well, these, these two different scenarios have been proposed in the literature. And here we have two examples, one from 2017 that conclude that dusty star forming galaxies at a uh, redshift greater than four are basically insignificant. But then we have another uh, work which suggests that dusty star forming galaxies dominate all the cosmic star formation rate density above uh, a redshift of four. So again, just to summarize why this measurement, uh, or why we don't have good, good constraints on this is basically because of the large, the large area survey that we have with Herschel and SPT are only sensitive to, to the most extreme and lens galaxies. So since these galaxies are amplified, we cannot derive um, a volume density. And we have these deeper observation, this, these are the kind of observation obtained with Aztec and with Escuba too in the past. And this, this observation can actually detect galaxies which are less extreme, like luminosity below 10 to the 12 even up to redshift of six. The problem with this is that basically in order to, to derive the star formation rate density between redshift four and, and six from this observation, we need uh, basically 100% completeness in our spectroscopic redshift. And why we need 100% completeness is basically because if we look at these two different uh, hypothetical scenarios, the difference between this line in which the dust obscure is negligible at, at high redshift and between this other model or scenario in which the dust obscure dominates, the difference be between these two lines uh, is basically if we have only 3% of galaxies have a redshift of four, which would be this case, or if we have 7% of galaxies and um, have a redshift of, of four will be this case. So, just this minor difference in the fraction of, of dusty star forming galaxies or in the redshift distribution of this population make a different and very dramatically change in our, in our understanding of the star formation rate density. So if we identify, for example, from a sample of 50, if we identify seven galaxies with redshifts greater than four or only two galaxies with redshifts greater than four, we will, we will come up with very different results in, in the contribution of this galaxy to the star formation rate density. So that's why we basically need uh, a spectroscopic surveys which are 100% 100 complete. And the problem with this is that obtaining a spectroscopic redshift uh, for submillimeter galaxies is actually really, really hard. It's probably the, one of the most hardest thing to do um, related to SMTs characterization. And just to illustrate how, dif how difficult it is to, to derive a spectroscopic redshift, I will present this, uh, this study that we did uh, related with a source called Aztec 2. So Aztec 2 is actually one of the brightest galaxies in, in the sky uh, at submillimeter wavelengths. It was detected more than 10 years ago uh, in this survey 
uh, which in this survey was actually, it was actually the second brightest galaxy. And in this other survey was the third uh, bright, brightest galaxy. More important, these galaxy have observation at other wavelengths, like observation with Herschel, Scuba, 850 microns, Aztec, one millimeter, Herschel from 250 to 500 microns, Gizmo at two millimeter, radio uh, detection, and probably more important, SMA observation. And why I, I said more important is because the SMA observation, because of the angular resolution, this give us um, very high confidence in the position of these galaxies. So we can, we can try to fi find counterparts of these galaxies at different wavelengths and also do follow-up observation at the position that we, that we obtain from the SMA. So we, beyond this observation, which are all of them far infrared and submillimeter wavelength, this galaxy also have um, a spectroscopic observation from the largest uh, optical telescope in the world. So these are observation with VLT on the left, and we have also observation with Keck, uh, and this, the spectrum is on the right. And here in this image, we can see the configuration of the different slits. And this yellow uh, circle is basically the SMA uh, observation, and this is the SMA positional uncertainty. This blue contour is radio detection from VLA, and basically what we found is this system, of, there are two galaxies in this system. One is a foreground galaxy, which basically is invisible at some millimeter wavelength, or that's what we believe. This is a redshift galaxy 1.3. And then there is the, this galaxy, the galaxy that was detected with VLT and with Keck. And from this observation, we derive a, a redshift um, of 1.1.1. So again, this is one of the brightest galaxies in all the sky. And we have observation from basically the most powerful telescope from submillimeter wave and to far infrared and also optical. And we, we found this redshift 1.1. And this redshift was actually used in, in the literature for, for around 10 years. And this, these are just some examples. But recently we found, we obtained actually ALMA observation on this galaxy. And what we found was something very interesting. The ALMA continuum observation in this uh, zoom in, this is, I mean, this, this is the original Aztec detection here. And here on the right, we have a zoom in of, of the ALMA uh, observation. So the ALMA contours are illustrated by these green uh, contours. And we can see that actually the, the, the galaxy, which is a redshift 1.1, this galaxy is actually not a submillimeter galaxy. The real submillimeter emission or millimeter emission comes from another source, which is uh, just above these this galaxies as revealed by, by, Aztec, by ALMA, sorry. And actually ALMA revealed that the, there are two components, one which we call Aztec two, which is the main component and another source, which is Aztec two B. So again, this star forming galaxy at 1.1 is not associated with the submillimeter galaxy. So fortunately, we, we were just studying the dust continuum emission with ALMA, but we just look at the data cube and we found serendipitously, we found this line also just at the very edge of our, of our coverage, but we found this line and we associate this line with the carbon two line at redshift 4.6. And to confirm the redshift, we, we requested NOEMA observations. And in, as you can see here, we also detect a different transition. This is the CO5 to 4 transition. And basically what we conclude is that Aztec 2 is not a galaxy at, at redshift 1.1 as was believed during the last decade. This is actually a galaxy and a pair of galaxies at redshift 4.6. So this galaxy itself, it's very interesting because it actually shows some uh, characteristics typical of uh, a rotating uh, disk galaxy as we can see here in the velocity. And this is also the velocity, the rotation velocity. But well, that's, that's another story. The, the thing that I want to, to transmit here is that Again, if we remember the difference between these two scenarios is just of a few percent. So if we have 
a lot of, a lot of my misidentifications as the case of Aztec II, we are going to to conclude like or to derive estimation which are actually wrong. So that's why we need um, basically 100% completeness in our spectroscopic redshift surveys. And the most important is probably that we need to do this spectroscopy follow-up at um, submillimeter wavelengths or probably near infrared wavelengths in order to derive redshift. So actually the picture at higher redshift, like beyond redshift of six, it's, it's actually more complicated. Why? Uh, because usually we use the CO lines <clears throat> to derive redshifts. And as we can see here in this image on the right, the bottom right, we can see that the typical spectral line energy distribution of submillimeter galaxies peak at a transition of uh, four to three or probably five to four. But beyond, uh, because of the excitation, I mean, the higher J transition are fainter. And if we look at this, this is the, basically the different line transition. These, all the lines here are the CO, the different CO line transition as a function of redshift. And if, if we see, for example, the four to three transi transition, which is typically a bright uh, line, we see that above redshift of 4.5 or so is basically beyond of our current um, uh, instruments. This, these are the different ALMA bands, ALMA band three, ALMA band four, and so on until ALMA band, four, band 10. And the case is similar for the CO five to four transition, which basically beyond redshift six is out uh, from our current uh, technology. So this implies that we need different tracers beyond the CO in order to derive spectroscopic redshift. And actually the CO, the C plus line, this C2 line has been used uh, recently uh, to identify galaxies with above redshift of four. But I also want to mention that the, these oxygen lines could be, or are promising to identify galaxies, particularly for galaxies at very high redshift, like redshift eight or probably redshift 10. And this is one example, like this is again, the galaxy at redshift six that we identified with the LMT. And we recently, we obtained a detection of the oxy oxygen one, six, 63 microns transition. And this is actually the first detection of this line above redshift of four. Like the rest of observation that we have of this line come from galaxies which have a maximum redshift of three and most of them are also amplified. So this is the first, detection of oxygen one at, at high redshift. Uh, well, I mean, redshift of six or, or beyond. And this was actually done with the Apex telescope. So of course the LMT and ALMA is, is more sensitive that, that, than, us, the, than us Apex. Uh, so this means that we can use this line in the future to, to try to confirm redshift of galaxies above redshift of six, probably up to redshift eight or 10, depending on, on the metallicity and different things. So again, uh, all this is just, well, it was a very large introduction, but it was just basically to say that our current understanding of the dust obscure star formation rate density is limited, particularly above redshift of four. And this is uh, basically the goal of the work that I want to present here. So what we are using is basically using a new ALMA a survey at two millimeter <clears throat> and combine this survey with a model of the, a model of galaxies, of, of particularly of dusty star forming galaxies to, to try to constrain the infrared luminosity function. And then the dust obscure star formation rate density using specifically measurements of the, of the galaxy number counts. And I, I'll go to, I'm going to describe this in more detail. So yeah, basically we, we want to use all the, the different observation that we have at, at all the submillimeter and millimeter wavelength. And we are going to use in combination with our model to, to derive and to constrain the infraluminosity function. The model is, is basically described in a series of two papers published like two years ago. But the main ingredient, ingredients are basically these two things. One is the infraluminosity function and its evolution with redshift. And we combine this with a library of spectral energy distribution that represent the emission of the dust. 
And while combine, combining these two different things, we can create simulation, uh, trying to mimic the, the real observation. And then we can compare the, the simulation with the observation uh, and then uh, fine tuning the, the, the model parameters. So yeah, basically, and this is the process that we uh, follow to constrain the different luminosity function. We start with, with an assumption of the infrared luminosity function. Basically, the, the infrared luminosity function is described by a broken power law. And below redshift of three, we use the, the measurements that are already available in the literature. I mean, the, the infrared luminosity function is well constrained up to redshift of three. But beyond redshift of three, we just explore different uh, evolutionary scenarios for the, for, for the infrared luminosity function. Then we combine this luminosity function with our library of SEDs that represent the emission of the dust at different wavelengths. So the luminosity function tell us how many galaxies we have as a function of luminosity and as a function of redshift. And then we use the spectral energy distribution of galaxies to simulate maps uh, of yeah, re different regions of the sky at different wavelengths. And this is just illustrated here. This, these are the same region of the sky simulated maps um, based on the, this infrared luminosity function and these SEDs. And we can create these maps at different wavelengths. Then we can combine this map uh, with a PSF of a telescope. I mean, we can degrade the angular resolution and we can also add noise to our, to our maps trying to reproduce the, the real observation. So if we do that, we, we can do simulation similar to this. These are actually our simulated maps that represent the different observational surveys that are available in the literature. These are, for example, simulation of the 70 microns packs with Herschel. Um, these are all of these are Herschel observation, I mean, simulated Herschel observation. We also have simulated 450 micron scuba two observation, A50 micron scuba two observation, Aztec observation at one millimeter, and the Gizmo observation at two millimeter. Then we can use the simulated maps and just basically count the galaxies that we have here and divide by the area. And we can estimate the galaxy number counts in these different simulated maps. Basically, the galaxy number counts tell us the number of galaxies that we have as a function of flux density. So now we have our simulated number count from our simulated maps. And then we can compare the simulated number counts with the real number counts that we have from all the different surveys. So this is just an example here in gray. We have the, the real data from, from the observational survey. And in orange, we have the number counts that we derive from our simulation. So in this case, the model uh, basically does not reproduce the data very well. So we can go back to our model and then, for example, change the infrared luminosity function, assume a different evolution at high redshift and repeat all the process again. And then we can now in this case, for example, we have a, a model for the infrared luminosity function that better describes the data. So with this process, we can iterate and at the end, derive the best fit infrared luminosity function and its evolution with redshift. And once we have the infrared luminosity function, we can integrate it and just derive the dust of secure star formation rate density as a function of redshift. So this is basically the outflow that we follow to constrain the infrared luminosity function from using our model and, and using the real observation that are available. And, and these are just predictions from, from this model that we presented in the same paper. Uh, and just to illustrate the differences, we just assume two hypothetical scenarios, which actually represent the scenarios that I described before in the star formation rate density. One, which is called the dust rich universe model, uh, adopts an infraluminosity function that basically uh, when translated to the star formation rate density, uh, dominates the total star formation rate density up to redshift of six. On the other hand, the blue prediction, which are what we call the dust poor universe, this, uh, this uh, uh, modeling with the star formation rate density is negligible above redshift of four. So these are very two extreme scenarios. 
And the interesting thing that we can see is that, for example, at this wavelength from 100 microns to 500 microns, basically, the prediction from the model are basically the same. So there are no difference, uh, even when the, the two models adopts a very different inflammatory function at high, at high redshift. And the reason for that is because these sharp wavelength observations are basically dominated by a population of relatively low redshift galaxies. So galaxies, we have redshift less than three. And because the infraluminosity function is the same in the model between redshift zero and three, this implies that basically we have the same prediction for, for the two different models. The differences in the, in the two different scenarios are actually more visible at long wavelength observation, and particularly beyond redshift of one millimeter. But we, we can start to see the difference at five, five, uh, sorry, 850 microns that we can see here. So yeah, this is the prediction for the 850 microns, one millimeter and two millimeter. And we can see now that we have a, a different um, result for the dust rich model and the uh, dust poor universe. The thing is that the current data, and just because of the uncertainties and the measurements, we cannot rule out uh, or distinguish between these two different scenarios. Also, uh, there is a hint that probably the, the truth is something somewhere in between. And this is expected because these were just two extreme scenarios uh, just to illustrate how the model works and, and just to, fi to find also what's the best wavelength to distinguish between these. Uh, yeah, so the conclusion is one is like, of course, like short wavelength observation are not able to distinguish the infraluminative function at high redshift. And in order to do that, we need long wavelength observation and particularly observation at one millimeter or longer, longer wavelength. This can also be under, understood just looking at what we call the K correction. So they, in this plot, what I am showing is the expected flux density for a galaxy with a fixed luminosity as a function of redshift. And this is for the 250 micron band. So as we can see the flux density decreases as, as we move to higher and higher redshift. Mm. If we look now at one millimeter, we have what we call the negative K correction, or in this case, the, a flat K correction. And basically the flux of a galaxy is basically the same between redshift one to redshift eight. So it doesn't matter if we have a galaxy at redshift eight or a galaxy at redshift one, the flux density that we are going to observe is, is the same at one millimeter <clears throat> at fixed luminosity. Of course, this depends on dust temperature and other things, but this is the general idea. But if, if we go to long, longer wavelengths like two millimeter and three millimeter observation, we see that this effect is more um, dramatically. And this is what we call the negative K correction, which basically indicates that the flux density of galaxies uh, at high redshift, like for example, redshift five or six, these galaxies are brighter than, than lower redshift galaxies. Uh, so this is very strange, but it happens just because of the slope of the Rally gene stale in the dust emission. So we can take advantage of this effect and for example, design surveys with this detection limit, and we can naturally filter out all these galaxies which are relatively at a low redshift. And we are going to detect only the galaxies that on average lie at, at higher redshift. And this actually was, was seen before from using observation. And this is the first paper that I published with Itzia and David, my supervisors. And basically what we found in this paper is if you go from short wavelength observation, in this case, from 450 micron observation to two millimeter, the redshift distribution of these galaxies increased as a function of wavelength, which is basically the same. So just summarizing long wavelength observation and particularly observation on one millimeter, two millimeter and three millimeter are more efficient to identify high redshift galaxies and therefore to constrain the infraluminosity function at high redshift. And this is the reason of why we did this survey. And um, this is the, what we call the MORA survey, it's mapping exploration to rayonization ALMA survey. Uh, we did this survey with just in, during the ALMA cycle six program. 
And this is not only the first sur survey at a wavelength of two millimeter, but this is the largest uh, mosaic that has been done with ALMA, uh, at least for in, at least with the goal of searching for the, for dusty star forming galaxies. This is a 185 square arc minutes, and it's it's almost 2,000 pointings of ALMA. I want to highlight this because ALMA is actually not an efficient telescope to do this kind of large observation because of the field of view and, and the design of, of the interferometer. But this, this is the only telescope uh, actually today, to date that, that can do the survey. The only other camera that, or instrument that can observe at two millimeter is in the IRAM telescope but because of the confusion noise, basically they cannot reach the sensitivity that we reach here, which in this case is 80 microjansky. So despite the fact that ALMA is not an efficient telescope to do large uh, uh, surveys, we did this with ALMA because it's basically the only facility that can do that. And we spent almost 2000 pointing to, to do uh, this, this map, which is, is the background uh, kind of purple color. And as a comparison, for example, this small uh, map here, this is the aspects, which is an ALMA large program. So we have a, an area which is more than an order, order of magnitude larger than, than that. So in this survey, we detected 13 galaxies above, above uh, five sigma. Um, and we basically, see, I mean, the contamination is very low, probably only one of the galaxies is fake. And these are uh, just some example of the sources that we have detected here. This is our two millimeter detection is here in this column. And we have uh, a spectroscopic redshift for two of these galaxies. One are, is a redshift 4.6 and the other is a redshift 5.8. This is actually the highest redshift galaxy uh, identified in the cosmos field, uh, which is where our map is, is located. And we have other galaxies with photometric redshift from, um, from the optical and near infrared uh, photometry or, or from, from this far infrared submillimeter photometry. And basically these galaxies lie between redshift three to four. And we have also these cases, uh, what are called HST dark galaxies. Uh, here you can see that we have the two millimeter detection and the galaxy is also detected in the Spitzer uh, channels, but then in HST, we have basically no detection. Uh, that's why they are, these are called HST dark galaxies, which are more common uh, in the, have been more common in the recent years. So what we have done, uh, particularly what I have done is estimate the two millimeter number counts from this survey, because we are interested in using the number counts and the model that I described before to constrain the infrared luminosity function. So this is the two millimeter number counts that we derived from the survey. These are the blue points here. And as a comparison, we have the only other results from the literature, these two, the orange and these green each. And squares, both of them come from the same survey, just different recipes for the blending, the fluxes and contamination and other things. And, and this is the, the other number comes estimation from the Gizmo uh, camera in Iran, but this is very highly confused. So this excess is probably related to uh, uh, contamination in the, in the flux densities. So yeah, we have derived the first two millimeter number counts using ALMA or the first number counts at this wavelength using um, observation with an angular resolution of around, around one arc second. And then what we did is again, use the model that I described before, in, but now in combination of these number counts, we, we use the two millimeter number counts that we just, the ones that I just presented, but also we use the 1.2 millimeter number counts from the aspects survey, which is the ALMA large program. These are these blue points. And at three millimeter, we also use the number counts that uh, I also presented two years ago in this paper, which are the only number counts at three millimeter actually. So yeah, the blue points are the number counts that we use in our fitting uh, to derive the best fit parameters. And in green, I don't know if you can see this green square, these are other results from the literature. 
And in gray, what we have uh, are the predictions from our best fit model. So you can see that the best fit model that we, that we derive basically reproduce the three number counts simultaneously. And not only the number counts that were used in the analysis, in the fitting, but also the number counts uh, that, that are, have been reported in the literature. And also, if we look at the other wavelengths, our model also reproduces the number counts uh, at short wavelengths. These are the different estimation from the from previous work. And again, in gray, we have the prediction from our model. And um, the number counts are, are well reproduced at basically all the wavelength from 70 microns to three millimeter, uh, which is all the data that has been collected during the last two decades using far infrared and submillimeter and millimeter telescope. So these number counts and this best fit parameter pro provide us with good constraints or relatively good constraints on the infrared luminosity function at high redshift. Uh, and this, these are the parameters that we fit one is the, well, let me briefly describe the infrared luminosity function that we are using. As I said, it's a broken power law described in the faint end by this slope alpha and by this beta on, in the right end. And also there is a normalization, which is called this, this C star parameter, basically the number density of galaxies. And these are the parameters that we are fitting here. One is alpha which is the faint end of the luminosity function. And the other is this value of C2, which basically determines the evolution of the number density of galaxies at high redshift, which is this value. And what we have found, I mean, I, I won't tell about, I won't go into the details, but we use two different methodologies to constrain this parameter, but we obtained consistent result from the two methodol methodologies. We found that the infraluminosity function or the particularly the faint end of the infraluminosity function is very faint. Sorry, it's faint, it's very flat. And the slope that we found is around minus 0.4. Uh, in, regarding the C2, the evolution of the number density, we have a very steep evolution with redshift, which basically indicates that if, as we move to higher and higher redshift, the number of dusty star forming galaxies decreases very rapidly. And also we constrain the emissivity index of the dust emission and it's well constrained to the typical values. So just uh, to compare the faint end luminosity function that we found for the, for the infrared luminosity function to that from the UV luminosity function, we can see that the faint end of the UV luminosity function is actually relatively, it's, well, it's quite a steep with a value of minus, point, uh, minus two. And we can see here this, uh, this, this part here. And this is the reason of why in the Hubble deep field, for example, there are too many galaxies. And it's because if you go to fainter and fainter galaxies, you will find a lot of galaxies. But this is not the case in the infrared. So this flat luminosity function indicate that if you go deeper and deeper, you will not necessarily find more and more galaxies. Regarding the evolution of the number density, this actually is very similar to the evolution of the space density found for the brightest UV selected galaxies. This is the space density of UV galaxies, which magnitude of minus 21, which, is, which are the brightest galaxies. And we can see the slope is minus 5.9, which is similar to the value that we found around minus six, minus six. So this suggests probably that these dusty star forming galaxies live in similar dark matter halos that, that the brightest UV galaxies. And that's why they have this similar evolution. So now we can use this infraluminosity function here with the best fit parameter and integrate, well, first convert the, infra, the infrared luminosity to a star formation rate and then integrate and we can derive the star formation rate density or particularly the dust obscure star formation rate density as a function of redshift. And this is what I have here. The result from integrating uh, the infraluminosity function are represented by this uh, orange region and these points are different results from the literature. So we basically extend, uh, our result extends up to redshift of seven where, where there are no measurements. 
and constrain the, if the evolution of the dust obscure star formation rate density above redshift of four, where the, the uncertainties are really large. Uh, well, yeah, one of the conclusions is that as we knew before that the star formation rate density, or at least the dust obscure star formation rate density peaks around redshift of two or 2.5, but then it decreases uh, and decreases rapidly with redshift actually. We can also break down this contribution as a, with, as a function of luminosity, for example. And we can see, for example, that at low redshift or redshift one uh, or below, most of the star formation rate density come from galaxies with, which are relatively faint below 10 to the 11 or, or around 10 to the 11 solar luminosities. But at high redshift, most of the contribution of the dust obscure star formation rate density come from very bright galaxies, like Euler-like galaxies with luminosities of 10 to the 12 or, or, or more. And this is contrary to the UV uh, estimation, I mean, contrary to the unobscured star, forma star formation rate density, because in that case, most of the contribution come from the faint galaxies. In this case, uh, the majority comes from the brightest galaxies. Uh, we can also compare this with the UV, with the unobscured star formation rate density. This is not corrected uh, for any dust extinction or anything. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, well, this is represented here by the uh, blue region. And we can see basically that the infrared or the dust obscured star formation rate density is comparable to the UV between region four and five. And beyond redshift five, there is this transition from having a dust dominated star formation rate density to start to be dominated by unobscure star formation rate density. So we can just look at this at, in this in this panel on the top, which is a fraction of obscuration. And again, the transition happens around redshift four or five. And yeah, one of the most important results is from this work is that above redshift of, of six or particularly during the first billion year of the universe, uh, this result suggests that the star formation rate density uh, is actually dominated by unobscured star formation. So the dust obscure star formation, uh, it's not as significant or uh, as important as, as is it during the peak, for example, of, of the cosmic history of star formation. So this is one of the first constraints to the dust obscure star formation rate density, or particularly the first constraint above redshift of six using directly observation from far infrared and submillimeter and millimeter surveys. And it's one of the first constraints to the dust obscure star formation rate density above redshift of four. And I mean, basically the decreasing the uncertainties on the measurement that we have before. So yeah, this is basically the result I'm also almost out of time, uh, but this is a result that, that I wanted to present. This is one of the first estimation of the evolution of the infraluminosity function up to redshift seven and, and the dust obscure star formation rate density uh, and how it, it is break down in, in terms of uh, luminosity. Yeah. yeah, and well, just generally speaking, this constraint is very important, uh, for example, to test the prediction from simulation of, or galaxy formation and evolution model and, and represents like, well, a, a measurement of the total star formation rate density of the universe during the last 13 billion years. And I think I, I'll, I'll just stop here and, and take any questions if there are, thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Okay, let's see some hands up. We have times for a few questions. Uh, Jacopo. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to to know uh, whether, he, how are you sure you're not biased by quasars or by, let's say, <clears throat> AGN activity? Mm. Yeah, I mean, in the case, AGN could be, let me go back to this plot. Yeah, 
Yeah, AGN has, has been found to probably contribute, um, particularly at short wavelengths, I would say 100 microns, 70 microns. That's where the AGN and the emission from hot dust, uh, it's significant. But it is well known that, I mean, above, at long wavelength, about 500 microns, and particularly in the wavelength that we are using here, like one millimeter, two millimeter, and three millimeter, uh, the contribution from AGN is basically insignificant uh, to the number counts. Uh, actually, it's, it's an important question because in our model, we are not using any AGN contribution. We are just using the dust emission that comes from the star formation. Uh, so it, it was something that we check, I mean, in the samples that we have so with at one millimeter or two millimeter, we have checked using, for example, X-ray or um, radio, or even uh, the Spitzer channels, uh, trying to look for excess in the near infrared. And for example, for the two millimeter sample, there is one source that ha has uh, AGN or just some suggestion of AGN based on the flux that we measure from radio. So for the number counts, we remove the contamination, which was around 30% of the flux of that particular source. We remove the contribution from that AGN before doing the number counts. But yeah, like in general, AGN is, it has been found to contribute just uh, very minor at long wavelength. I mean, at one millimeter, two millimeter and three millimeter. So basically you're saying that you have other means to uh, remove the AGN because uh, I, I don't think what is generally believed uh, is true. That is the AGN just contribute to either like with a synchrotron and jet and just to dust, auto dust emission uh, because there's uh, people are now started to uh, see from simulation, especially that uh, especially for quasars, uh, the let's say the, the, the central AGN, the equation, this might contribute up to 80% to the far infrared luminosity. Because <clears throat> for the most luminous quasar, the, there might be no uh, dusty torus. So the UV and optical radiation for the accretion, this might be able to escape and basically propagate through all the galaxy and might be a very important source of uh, far infrared. Yeah, that's true. I mean, once you have a, a, a quasar, or if you, you identify a, a source to be a quasar, it is likely that that source may be contaminated. The flux that you measure or the, or the infrared luminosity may be contaminated for that particular source uh, on the level of, uh, as I said, from 30, 40, 50%, you said 80%. That's, that's possible. I mean, that's possible. The thing is that this one quasar source that you have is going to be just one in a sample of, let's say 50 or 30 uh, galaxies that are powered by star formation. So when you take the contribution of all these star forming galaxies, which are not contaminated by those, and you include this one galaxy, one this quasar, which actually contaminate the infrared luminosity. And when you put all this together, the contribution from the quasar or the AGN is, is minor to the general population of the of dust star forming galaxies. So, That's so you have I mean. the mean, yeah, yeah. So, so you have the mean to tell that a galaxy is an AGN. So that's that's the point. Sorry, say it again. Uh, that you are able to understand whether a galaxy in your sample is an AGN or not. So that's that's yeah, the yeah. Main point basically. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jacopo. Do we have any other questions? I don't see any raised hands. Okay, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Jorge again. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you.